thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today I'll be talking about a piece called Quattro Fragmenti di Tempo, Four Fragments of Time, by the Brazilian composer Marcos Siquet. So, let's get started. So this is Marcos Siqueira. He was born in 1974. Uh, as I mentioned, Brazilian, born in the small town of Caratinga, Minas Gerais. Uh, which is more well, like in the middle of Brazil. He has an undergraduate degree in music performance by, um, by the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and he studied composition uh, with Didi Correa de Oliveira, which is one of the most important composers in Brazil, uh, in parallel with his, his guitar studies. He was in a composition major where he started studying composition. And later, uh, when he finished his degree, he started dedicating himself just to composition, and not as a guitar performer anymore. He was award awarded 11 uh, prizes in, in competitions of composition, theater, and film festivals in Brazil. Uh, received commissions from three major compositions grants in Brazil. He was premiered by some of the most renowned orchestras in Brazil. Uh, and had his work, works performed in contemporary music festivals by Brazilian and international artists uh, in South America, North America, and Europe. Uh, he has works for any formations that you can imagine, orchestra, choir, solo, uh, chamber music. Um, he has over 20 of his works published and recorded, and he developed an intense pedagogical uh, activity in Brazil and in Italy as well, where he is now a resident. Uh, I would like to just give a historical, quick historical context so we understand where Marcus is in comparison with other composers that made music for guitar. So in Brazil, guitar is a popular instrument, it's part of our culture, and we have this lineage that starts at the end of the 19th century of popular musicians usually professional accompanists that also create instrumental music, uh, developing music for guitar. So, and this lineage uh, starts in the 19th century and is very much alive today. Uh, so these musicians, composers, they are non-academic, they are not connected to academia uh, in any way. Um, they, their music is mostly based on Brazilian popular music and it's very idiomatic. They have a very good knowledge of the instrument, so uh, they know how to explore uh, the potentialities of the guitar uh, very well. After that, uh, in the 1910s, we start having non guitarist composers writing for the guitar for the first time, the first one of them being Heitor de Balobos, which is probably the, the, the name that is most famous outside of Brazil. Uh, those who are classically trained composers um, and the nationalist style, uh, and they would borrow a lot of techniques from Impressionism. Uh, the Second Viennese School didn't have a lot of influence on these composers. Uh, they deemed it not uh, suitable to, well, let's say, sing the Brazilian music uh, in an orchestral form or in a classical form. So they applied uh, uh, classical techniques to popular genres. That's mainly what they did. They developed a significant uh, amount of works for guitar, and also very idiomatic because they were in close touch with popular musicians. Heitor uh, Villalobos is known by playing Chorus, which is a Brazilian genre that is very popular uh, while he was having his classical education. So he grew up with these two sides, the popular and the classical music. Uh, after that, uh, we start having the fifties, the second generation of composers that decides to abandon Brazilian popular music and especially nationalism because at that point they saw what nationalism did in, <laughs> in the whole world and it was not a very good uh, thing to keep doing I guess uh, and they embraced uh, the expression uh, expressionist techniques and postmodern techniques um, and they were also academic composers so that influenced a lot of uh, Musicians and composers, by the fact that they were in academia, so there was this whole movement to now embrace the uh, postmodern techniques. Um, their music is not as idiomatic. Uh, and I would guess 
that much of that is for um, maybe not such a close contact with the guitar and in a way trying to push a certain way of writing or aesthetics into the guitar without taking into consideration how we use open strings to play, how the resonance in the guitar works, so they're not always very idiomatic. Not that they're not good words, they're great words, just not as idiomatic. Um, and finally, also starting uh, somewhere at the same time, uh, we start have to be classical guitarist composers. Uh, those are classical guitarists that had their classical education in school, so they are most, most academics and professors. Uh, and they will write using classical technique, uh, but basing their production mostly in Brazilian popular music as well, as the first generation that we have. There is a return of Brazilian popular music through those composers. They will apply some of the techniques that are from postmodernism, but in a very modest way. It's not what they're trying to go for. They have a significant number of works, and because they're guitarists, they're all very idiomatic. And then we have, finally, this new generation of composers that is arising in Brazil, which are classically trained guitarists. They know the instruments very well, uh, but they're, they decided to give up their career as performance in favor of composing music. Uh, they do not uh, explore nationalism at all, and very little, if none, Brazilian popular music. Uh, they will explore postmodernism and uh, ex Tender techniques, uh, new textures with the instrument, and given their knowledge of the, the guitar, they are reimagining what is idiomatic for the instrument. So there's a new technical language that these composers are developing for the instrument. Uh, they have a significant uh, number of guitar works. They have a very strong connection with the guitar. Uh, some of the most famous are Arthur Cantella, who teaches in Columbia University uh, today, then Marco Siqueira, who I'm going to be speaking about his music a little bit more. Uh, so we're going to take a look at his compositional style for guitar in specific. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, you can go to his website, listen to a lot of his music, it's very interesting, and uh, I highly recommend you to know this composer better. It's really impressive, his work. His guitar works is just as very small part of like, his output. So he starts composing for guitar in 1999. Um, he started composing uh, professionally, let's say, let's put it like that, in 1996. Uh, and he already started with a piece that he won a prize for. It was a piece of solo suit. He starts composing for guitar only three years later because, according to himself, he didn't, he, he stopped playing guitar because he didn't want to be tied to what his hands were able to do or unable to do. He wanted to be free from the restraints of what his hands can play. Uh, and he kept without playing guitar for almost 20 years. <laughs> uh, no, almost 10 years, I think. I don't remember correctly. 20 years. Yeah, something like that. Uh, between 10 and 10. <laughs> Uh, so, his first four pieces are miniatures that served as a laboratory for uh, his style. He started developing his language in those four pieces and everything that we see here will bleed to, the, to everything that comes after. So, it is atonal, it has a lot of complex rhythms, um, it has a flexible a logic, by that I mean uh, he uses a lot of rubato, accelerando, fermatas, uh, different types of fermatas, so he is molding the time with uh, a logic. Uh, he will explore a wide range of dynamics from 4P to 4Fs. Uh, and he always has an ongoing dialogue with the classical Western music tradition. So, for example, here we can see in Front Key and Passacaglia and other works will make reference to uh, the tradition of our Western music repertoire. Uh, technically speaking, he will avoid uh, any guitaristic technical formula that, that are very common and they come from the classical style and they're still being used with today. So, for example, scales, arpeggios, and slurs. So, you will try, whenever you use that, to imagine that or explore other techniques. Uh, and some of the resources that he applied to uh, find new ways 
to write for guitar, one of them was using unusual discordatura, unusual tunings. So we have a standard tuning for the guitar, um, and we will always experiment with that. So for example, this guitar at the moment, uh, the four strings in the middle are, and it's a standard tuning, but the first string is a half step higher than what it should be, and the sixth string half step lower. Uh, so that would be a scordatura, a specific kind of tuning. Scordatura in, in, in Italian is, it means something like out of tuning. Um, and this one here has a very peculiar one that yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, he will uh, use the entire guitar tessitura or the entire range of notes. He's not afraid to explore the whole guitar neck, uh, which we don't see very often you know, in the guitar repertoire. Uh, he will uh, explore harmonics on the guitar, so we have specific places that we barely touch the string and it rings in a different way, it has a different color to it. Uh, he will use uh, this to create textures and even polyphonic passages. Uh, and as well as campanellas. Campanellas, campanella is a technique uh, that was uh, explored during the Baroque period by Baroque guitarists and movements, um, where instead of playing scales uh, like we traditionally would, like say, uh, two or more notes on a string, uh, we would try to put one note per string. And as you are using different strings, you try to keep all these notes ringing. And this uh, gives the effect that where the name is coming from, campanas means bells. So it's like little bells that are ringing. For example, uh, something like that. So you always have something that is leading to the next note uh, and they sound like they sound like little bells so he will use that very often and because of this very specific way of writing he has something that uh, sometimes it's common sometimes it's not but in his, in his case i would say it's essential when we learn his music which is the precise indication of fingers. He's telling you exactly how to play it because if he's telling us that he wants that note on the fourth string is because he thought of, about that finger, that color, and he really wants that. Of course, he will accept suggestions. So he's not so inflexible, but he is very aware of how everything is going to sound. Uh, and uh, a lot of these textures, uh, he's exploring the use of the resonance of the guitar, which is very important. If, if we want the guitar to sound like a bigger instrument than what it is, it's a very intimate instrument. But when the composer knows how to use resonance, it, it grows. So it sounds much more interesting. So I'm going to show you an example, a quick example of everything that we just talked here in a little short piece uh, called Impunki Le Hip. Uh, we can see here, for example, all these uh, descending scales. Uh, they will be with that campanella effect, where you see ND is right hand doing harmonics, so there's a little bit of everything. You can see that we have uh, rubato and uh, accelerando and all the flexibility we were talking about. The rhythm, I wouldn't say it's simple. <laughs> so let's take a look at the examples. <laughs>
So after 1999, uh, in the year 2000 to 2009, we have a language consolidation. Um, so he will start exploring this language uh, in longer works uh, that have a denser uh, musical discourse. Uh, he will keep developing the rhythm, making it more complex. Uh, he will start exploring the tessitura in a more pointillistic way. So we're going to have huge jumps uh, in the register, um, and uh, the melody will be a little bit more scattered. Um, and he will start writing out on the music psychological and theatrical elements. He will include those elements, and by theatrical, uh, it could be the performer moving or doing something specific during the piece. And the psychological aspect, uh, I'm going to show you an example. He's trying to write in a way that forces you to emulate a certain feeling or pathos. Um, he will start exploring chamber music with guitar. Um, as I mentioned before, continue that dialogue and tradition with Oketus, which is a, a, a style from uh, medieval times, uh, Fantasia cycles, and start quoting other composers. There is a piece called Fantasia Sommersa, the last one, that quotes uh, Wagner. And uh, he will do that in other works as well with composers that are very influential for him. Uh, and also, uh, in that period, he has his first guitar piece commissioned. Uh, and it's an homage to uh, Ida Presti, which is a French guitarist. So they uh, made a grant for that, and he was the winner in that competition. Technically speaking, he will keep expanding those ideas that we just showed, we just heard. Uh, he will expand uh, the scordatura, try different tunes, even uh, more um, wild, <laughs> I guess, uh, and more extended techniques, and also prepared guitar. So um, he will bring other elements that are not from the guitar. Uh, we, we could have, as an example, like a paper clip or anything that could generate a different sound uh, on the guitar to um, explore other technical and, and, and musical possibilities. In this case, uh, I think it's here. Okay. We're going to see an example very soon of a prepared guitar uh, in one of his pieces. So, Elegiri did with his first uh, longer piece, about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and this is a very good ex example of rhythm. Uh, if we look at the very last uh, portion of this last system, we have nested tuplets. Uh, so we have a tuplet of five and um, quarter notes and on, on the bass, and on the soprano, we have a tuplet of uh, 18 notes. And within that, a triplet of 30 second notes. So that's uh, very complex, uh, often called uh, new complexity. And this is a clear influence uh, of Ferdinand. Um, and he's trying to explore those rhythms. And, and we can find a lot of examples like that in this piece. Uh, Religious in Sadis is another piece. It could 
be translated as delirium in series, and he started trying to write out the delirium uh, by using a lot of those shifts that I mentioned before. So he's jumping to high notes and very low register and going up and down. The rhythms are uh, very broken. Um, and also he asks for rubato and accelerando right away. So it's kind of delirium that is written there to influence the performer to uh, achieve that psychological effect. Um, the next example I would like to show this is the example with the prepared guitar. So here we can see, uh, I hope you can see well, uh, each one of these things is a guitar capo. So a guitar capo is basically like if you had someone holding a finger for you and you play just from here. <laughs> so it's a fake finger, let's say. Uh, and usually we only lose one um, when we need to play some country. Uh, <laughs> And in this piece, we're using three. What happens is, as you're playing, you take them out during your performance, and you have four different tunings in the same piece. Not to mention that in this piece, four strings out of the six strings are in a different tuning. So he's really experimenting with that idea. I'm gonna show you an example of something specific that he asks. Here we have a percussion um, passage, and right after that, when you see the arrow, he asks you to hit the cable so it flies, <laughs> and you are in the new tuning. So here is the effect. Uh, it's quick, let me show you one more time. <laughs> that two times in this piece and it's very effective and when you do the last time it goes to the very low tuning so it's very dramatic. Um, this is another example that kind of has a little bit of everything uh, so we're gonna have right hand harmonics, campanellas um, and the testura you can see that you have a really big range uh, of notes from the low to the high uh, and this passage here, you will see that the, the lower note, the, the, everything is played in harmonic, but the lower notes will keep ringing, and that will generate some kind of counterpoint, like Bach would do with the violin, for example. Like, just keep some notes in your head so you're hitting two lines at the same time. in this example. So right here is just one little tap, but I think it's worth uh, watching. So that's the moment in the piece where you have no cables anymore and you have that really low tuning. Um, and it sounds like hardcore electric guitar. Uh, so, the year 2000-2019 is a formal expansion uh, if we are talking about his 
guitar production. Uh, he will keep exploring the same ideas, same techniques, but he will um, expand to the form, genre, and the instrumentation that he will be using. So it's from that period that he writes his first guitar concerto. There's a chamber con concerto that includes guitar. Signo Sopro 3 is chamber concerto, and Signo Sopro 5 is the guitar concerto, or amplified guitar, very specific. Uh, he will also start using electronic music uh, and keeping that dialogue with the traditional, the tradition of Western classical music. Uh, technically speaking, it's just expanding what we saw before with the extended technique and, and tunings. He started writing a piece for two guitars and one performer uh, that is not finished yet, unfortunately. Um, and he starts using physical space to manipulate sound. So for example, uh, this is a trio um, wrote for the University of Kentucky guitar trio. This is our trio. This is our trio? Yeah. <laughs> uh, where he, he writing visions, that's how he calls it. So little movements and he will ask uh, the three performers to have six chairs and change positions as the piece is played to generate different uh, acoustic, uh, a different experience by moving the performance on the space. Uh, this is the first page for the guitar concerto and he asks for this piece another cable. This is a very special cable. It has those little levers so you can select which string you're gonna press or not. So you can go even crazier. Uh, I guess he dreamed about this for, <laughs> for his whole life. <laughs> and when he got it, he wrote the guitar concerto, like the biggest piece. Um, so 2020, where we're now, uh, he keeps writing strongly for guitar. So there's a cycle of 50 miniature and five other pieces that are called silences. Uh, there's a cycle that he wrote the first book of the cycle and there's, there are four more to come um, that would be something like 40 pieces, 40 more pieces um, and he wrote uh, the four fragments of time, the piece I'm going to be playing today and he also published his guitar book number one, it's a collection uh, of guitar works and a book that is a rhythm study, uh, a book about rhythm and methodology and studies of rhythm uh, so here is uh, the, his guitar book cover. I worked on that project as well, doing the musical review, the technical review, the translations, and, and a lot of other things. Uh, and this is his rhythm uh, book called Kronos i Kairos, which will be very important to understand uh, some aspects of this piece. So let's talk about the piece now. Quattro fragments of tempo, four fragments of time. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit about the performance aspects, technical aspects, and about the uh, narrative of the piece. What is behind this idea of time in this piece, in specific? Um, so this piece was commissioned by me uh, in 2019 and was finished in 2020, but this is still a work in progress. We were changing things like two weeks ago. Uh, and so we are still in that collaborative process between myself and the composer. Uh, the results of the collaborative process will be part of my DMA dissertation, and the final result will be the publication of this piece uh, in his second guitar book, uh, which I'll be participating in doing um, technical review and musical review and everything I can, I can get involved in this project, which, is a, which I'm really passionate about. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the scordatura. So we have two guitars. Guitar one has this very low scordatura. Let me play again. And the notes are so low, it is so unusual to read an instrument tuned like that, that he's writing in a transposition, in a transposing style. So we read the music as we were playing the Domo guitar, and we just like, Press the notes as we would if we were playing in the center tuning. So we just ignore the tuning. That makes it a lot easier to play. 
And the second guitar that has the tuning that I already told you, it's a half step up uh, on the first string and a half step down on the sixth string. So for that guitar, he will write with the real notes. So you have to adjust your mind a little bit when you're learning. Uh, in the first movement, you will notice that there's a lot of tuning going on in this piece. There are four specific points uh, that are marked with A, B, C, uh, C, and D on the score that we have to change the tuning of the guitar. And the whole goal uh, of changing this tuning is to get this guitar number one with the same tuning as the guitar number two. Uh, and then you might be wondering why you need two guitars if I'm going to tune this one exactly as the other one. We're going to get there. Uh, it's a cool part of the piece. Uh, on the second movement, one of the guitars will have the sixth string the tune until it is almost completely loose. Uh, so it's very experimental in, in what we can do uh, with the tuning of the guitar while we are playing. Um, that uh, sixth string out of tune will influence one of the movements if we choose to play this movement. So very briefly, in the third movement, we have the option to branch out and choose between four options or maybe more. Uh, and if we choose to play the option that is only acoustic guitar, uh, the sixth string will be altered. So it's, it's going to be different than what we are reading in the music. Uh, he will also explore, as we saw in other examples, uh, theatricality. Uh, there is something weird in my text. I apologize for that. When I opened my, my PowerPoint here, the computer didn't have the font. It messed it all up, and I had to fix it as quick as I could. Um, but he will indicate with this arrow that is over the word the, I guess, uh, right hand gestures that he, we, he wants us to make a big gesture after we play a certain note. Uh, and he will have other things in the piece, like asking the, the performer to keep the eyes closed, to enter the stage in a certain way to create that aura. It's a very ritualistic piece. You have to follow the ritual to make the piece uh, uh, speak for itself. Uh, and also, there will be other passages that the extended technique will be very dramatic as well. So it also has a lot of gesture. Gesture is an important thing for this composer. So even when he's not writing like a gesture for your arms, uh, he's writing the music in a way that makes you gesticulate. Uh, let's take a look at some of the extended techniques. Um, can I do it from here? Maybe not. I will keep circling around the computer. <laughs> so this example, it's, it's very simple. Um, he asks you to do a right hand movement like you were playing a descending scale on the piano on the side of the guitar and explore the, the, the tones that you can get in different places. Uh, the next example, he goes back to the tapping technique. So all those square notes, uh, square head notes, they are tapped. So they can be done with the left hand or the right hand. Um, but there will be several moments where we have two voices, then we have both at the same time. Uh, for example, the second system, we have to uh, do that line here, and the other voice is doing so we have both at the same time. It forces you to cross hands. Uh, so there will be passages like that, that we have to cross hands. I guess we could do like this, I just find it way harder. For some reason, crossing hands is a little bit easier. It feels more natural for the right hand. Maybe it's because I played some Van Halen when I was younger, and this is already uh, a little bit more natural. Uh, this is another example where he is using percussion on the guitar, but what is interesting is that we have our voice along with it. Um, 
and the rhythm is interesting. And we're going to talk about the rhythm in a moment. Uh, but what he's asking is to hit the guitar with so fingers three, two, and one, and play some open strings. It creates an interesting effect. And another similar example, we will do the same thing, but on the handstock of the guitar. to the straight back. So if I was to play this completely disregarding uh, his figures and his suggestions, uh, it would be, I will have to turn around a little bit, but it would be something like this. It's very magical, uh, I think. So you keep hearing those notes ring as this scale is playing. Uh, talking a little bit about the rhythm, uh, I don't know if you can see from there, but there's not a single uh, system where you don't have some kind of tuple and you, where you don't have to think a little bit of, about how, how am I going to play this, how do I count this. Uh, however, the effect is not a stiff. It's a, a, he writes those tuplets almost like he was writing rubato for you. So he, he's creating that time distortion uh, within his own writing and in a way influencing how you will uh, interpret that uh, rubato uh, when, you, when you play the piece. Uh, however, we do have some complex rhythms that we have to uh, take care of. The two that I find most interesting are the two on the second uh, system there. The ten against three with tappings, it was a little bit challenging. So we have to Play ten on this hand and three on this hand, and it's a little bit disorienting for me. But at least I hope it's not for who is listening. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it gives some work to play this passage in specific. And the other one is a three against two, uh, but the three is has the accent at every two. So, uh, something like that. Um, so Again, it, it sounds a little bit disorienting, uh, but it gives a very cool effect. measure, uh, we have three groups of seven. Oh, by the way, the, this time signature is interesting. Three by seven by sixteen. The first time I saw it, I, I couldn't figure out. I don't know if you saw that before. This is the first time that I saw something like this. Do you, you study percussion, right? Did you see this before? Interesting. <laughs> uh, so, it looks terrifying, but it's simpler than it looks. It's just three groups of seven by sixteen. So, and, and that's what we have here. One, two, three groups of seven by sixteen. So it's a simple way to organize a longer measure in a not uh, meter. Uh, so the, the top voice in the first measure is in seven, and the lower voice is in seven with a displaced accent. But when we go to the second measure, the top voice is in three, the lower voice is in seven. So 
polyneutral, two neutral at the same time. So I will go from the first measure to the second. And now, uh, what I consider to be the most interesting thing about the piece is the concept behind it. Uh, and how the composer is talking about time. Talking about time is something that is difficult no matter the area of study. So, this piece was inspired by, after he read a uh, class by a Brazilian philosopher and scholar. The class was called Time, Thought, and Freedom. Uh, and the scholar's name is Claudio Ulpiano. Uh, so in this class, he's talking about narratives of time in philosophy, physics, film, and literature. So he's discussing how different fields view time. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the inspiration came from this class, including the name of the movements. Um, that I think I have in the, yeah, I have the name in the next slide. So the movements are, the first movement is Tohu uh, Vavohu. I have no idea if that's how it's pronounced, this is in Hebrew. Uh, and it is about the birth of time. Now, the next movement, Arrow of Time, Flash of the Temple, Arrow, Arrow of Time. It's about the linear time, the time that we experience every day. Uh, bifurcations, bifurcations, it's about multiplicity of time, quantum physics, many worlds theory, superposition, all those uh, physics um, ideas. And last movement called Antigos Presentius, Asian Presence, is about the pure form of time, it's a more philosophical view of time. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, it's a biblical phrase. It comes from Genesis uh, chapter one, verse two, uh, and describes the condition of the earth without form and void. So that's what Tohu Wabuhu means, without form and void. Uh, so Sikeda wanted, wanted to represent what existed before anything was created. So in Tohu Wabuhu, the first movement, we have electronic music and the guitar. The electronic music represents that void, uh, that thing without form, before anything was created. Uh, and if we look at Genesis, uh, God, uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Uh, yada yada. <laughs> uh, on 1 3, he says, uh, Let there be light, and there was light. And in 1 4, God saw the light. That was good, and God divided the light from the darkness in one five, and called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So when he creates the light and separates the light from the darkness, God is creating time. Uh, and when the guitar entered uh, in the first movement, that's the, the moment that the time is born. Uh, here is just an example of the score. So we have a first portion that's just electronic music, and this is the guitar part, and more electronic music. Um, this just juxtaposition uh, between fixed media and real time performance creates a conflict between two different types of time the time that is perfect and it, it cannot be changed from the electronic music and the time of the performer that is never perfect. Uh, and Siqueira, he discusses a lot about this aspect uh, of the perfect chronological time and the human time in his uh, rhythm book uh, called Kronos and Kairos. So these two figures, Kronos is, uh, as you probably know, it's the person personification of time, uh, but Kairos is personification of opportunity and favorable moments. So it's kind of is about time. It's about the right time to do something. Uh, so Kronos is quantitative and Kairos is qualitative. It's, it's about the quality of time or making use of time in a, in a well, favorable way, let's say. Uh, so in, in his book, uh, Marcos has his own interpretation, which is 
Uh, Kronos is the representation of the precise metrification of rhythm, and Kairos is uh, flexible poetic time, free from absolute measurements, an appearance of something indeterminate in timeless. And he will use that uh, type of um, um, description whenever he's talking about our, our human condition and how we can interpret time and how we can humanly play uh, so uh, digital rhythms like he writes. He doesn't want it to be a machine when you do that. So he, he goes long ways discussing that in his book. Um, the second movement, which is the linear time, all the cicada also states that he felt the need to create the time in which our society is organized, the linear time, the time in which we are bound. So uh, this uh, movement is about uh, time as we experience it. Uh, uh, the term arrow of time relates to the one direction of time. We can only go forward in time. However, uh, time is relative. Uh, since Einstein, we know about time dilation. So depending on your perspective, time can be different. Uh, depending if you're closer to the speed of light or not, those kind of things. <laughs> uh, so this piece, uh, it's the one that most resembles the, this movement, sorry. It's the one that most resembles the traditional development that we have uh, in our classical Western classical music tradition, which would be presenting materials and developing them. So in that way, it represents the, the time that we have traditionally used it to experience. Uh, but again, oh, there's a little mistake here. Please don't, it's the font that got bigger. <laughs> but anyways, I forgot to say something. So he uh, is exploring that elasticity of time, that relative perspective of time, through this conflict between Kronos and Kairos. So Kronos, the metric time, very precise and rigid, and Kairos, very flexible, uh, with all these tuplets. So the intention between, between, behind all these tuplets is to make time flexible and relative. Uh, bifurcations, bifurcations is about the multiplicity of time. So here's this quote. I imagine a work in which the guitarist could decide which path to take. At the time of the coin toss, this is a weird term, uh, right? And with this change the predictability of the 50% heat probability. This is quantum, phys quantum physics jargon. This is exactly the type of terminology that physicists use when discussing quantum physics. So that's the idea. Um, in quantum physics, we call about we talk about superposition of states until you measure something. It can be up or down, left or right, or it can be in any position in the room until you measure the electron. So that's the idea behind that. So in the performance, when you get to the third movement, ideally, the performer would have to decide in the spot what to play. And it gives you two options and four strategies. So it gives you a piece that he wrote out and an electronic piece. You can choose to play the acoustic piece, the electronic piece, uh, with the, the intervention of the composer, so the composer pre-recorded some parts, uh, or you can play the electronic piece and play over it, or another option, yes, with the electronic piece, but playing only percussive elements on the guitar. So it gives you these four options, and you have to decide as you toss the coin, <laughs> uh, and take your chances. So here's just an example of the, the piece that is the acoustic piece. And finally, uh, in terms of presentious Asian presence, this is uh, about the pure form of time, which is, uh, for me, uh, a difficult concept to grasp. It's something new for me. I, I, I feel like I should be getting into the philosophy, of at least a philosophy minor, to, sorry, to, <laughs> to understand that better. Uh, but I'll try to explain uh, as uh, I learn it from the text which the, base, uh, which the piece is based. So um, Marco Siqueira is borrowing those concepts from that class, from the scholar Wu Piano, uh, and he's borrowing the concepts of Asian presence and the pure form of time. So the pure form of time 
is an idea that appeared in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Um, and Kant is trying to define a pure time and a pure space in the sense that time and space are not concepts from our mind, that they must pre-exist our uh, intelligence, in a way. Uh, Opiano will put that in a different way. He will uh, say that Kant uh, frees time from movement. So the way we understand time is a succession of things. Time moves in a specific way. If we take movement out of time, uh, we could be able to access time in any direction at any, well, the concept of time as we understand it, we stop existing and becomes just another dimension that we can move freely. Uh, Asian presence is an idea that is coming from the ways, if I'm not mistaken, and they are memories, basically. However, uh, they are not, memories are not the past. The past is a, let, let's think of the past as a dimension, as a place. Uh, the memories, the Asian presence, they are uh, transplanted to the present and altered by the fact that they are now in the present. They are the past, they become the present. And we very often have experienced that when we remember things, but we don't exactly remember how they were. Sometimes we're pretty sure that we, <laughs> we remember exactly how it was, but uh, we often find that that's not the case. So the time alters memories. So that's what the Asian present is. It's an altered memory. Um, and what the composer will do in this movement, he will let the performer completely free. You can pick any moment of the piece and put it together as you like. So it's basically a controlled improvisation with some suggestions. Uh, he defined that uh, this movement as a physical and idiomatic memory. So he wants the memory from your fingers uh, of the musical materials previously presented in an open form. All that is suggested can be changed, repeated, colored with any fingers. So this is one page of this movement, and you see all these loose elements. That it, uh, this is, uh, as he describes, uh, his memories at a specific point in time. So this is not the score that should follow. This is just an example of his own memories and how he thought uh, it would sound interesting. Uh, but you don't need to do necessarily what he's asking for. And it would be more spontaneous if you, if you did what you, what you really want to do. Uh, uh, the, the physical memory that is the most sticks with you, I think. Um, another interesting concept now we get to the second guitar, or better, the first guitar. Uh, Continuing his quote, he says, a physical and idiomatic memory uh, presented within a new frequency of time arising from the acoustic transformation generated by chromes. So this is kind of mysterious. Uh, so what is the acoustic transformation? When we start a piece, we use the guitar one with a very low tune, we play it, we change the tuning of the guitar until it gets at the same tuning of the guitar too. And we put it to rest for two movements. Then in the last movement we get the guitar back. What happens with guitar strings is that, especially nylon guitar strings, as we use in custom guitar, they, they are very sensible to temperature and to tuning. So even if I tune that guitar perfectly, the tuning will change uh, during the period of the other two movements. Uh, and it will get intentionally out of tune and intentionally micro microtonal. The, the tuning starts microtonal, and, but it will get intentionally microtonal. And, uh, and the result is, again, we don't know how the guitar will be sounding when we get it. But the idea is that that guitar that opened the piece and then comes back at the end as a nation present, as the name of the movement suggests, is now a representation of the passage of time. It's a representation of chromos. Uh, so it, it kind of holds the piece together in its concept of time. And finally, to conclude, uh, another interesting result of the way he wrote it, this piece is that, uh, as I said before, he, did, he decided to write a piece in which we can decide the past 
Thus, the present work could never be performed in the same way, never becoming an object possible of being described. This is very philosophical again. Therefore, incapacitated of existing. So, the object, the piece, exists only while the description lasts. After we finish playing, it doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, a little bit philosophical, uh, but a very interesting concept. Um, and this is it for, for the composer, the piece, it's the bibliography that I have, uh, I have been reading uh, for this work. And I would like to perform the piece for you. Uh, maybe do questions later after the piece? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll take, well, we'll take a quick break just to set up some things and tune the guitar. Uh, one thing that I would like to tell you is you might hear the, the turning part starting. And when this starts, the piece started, and, and, and that will be your cue. <laughs> Thank you. 